47 minute illegal interview on my daughter. Full of truly terrible news stories. Do you have any opinions on that? It has affected your attitude towards the WA police force. We misused the government's credit card whilst he was on holiday. Suing the state of WA and you, Carlo Kellingen. Of course, all those pressing issues here in Perth. Hello and welcome to a brand new week of Undercurrent and brace yourselves, it is the start of the school holidays. My name is Christy Monica. Well first up on tonight's show we take a look at some of the problems of living in residential parks and by residential parks I don't mean a park, I mean more like a caravan park. Alicia Pereira has the details. Approximately 29,000 Western Australians are long-term tenants of residential parks, which they view as a more affordable option to living in the suburbs. But because they don't own the land that they live on, they are vulnerable to rental hikes and park closures. With the Department of Commerce conducting a review into the laws governing residential parks, Undercurrent investigated the main issues at stake. We know there's some 29,000 residents across WA in parks, whether they're mixed-use caravan parks or lifestyle villages. Uh, the demographic tends to be somewhat older people, uh, so uh, often many on lower incomes as well. I've been here for 17 years and it's the best decision I ever made. It's been, um, I feel safer here than I would in suburbia. I have got fantastic neighbours. Um, the park is well run. Um, we have activities and it's just a wonderful way to live. The uh, Act was made in 2007 and after five years we're required to review its operation and check whether it's uh, working as intended or not. Residents' chief concern in this review is the security of their lease agreements with park operators. Many would prefer their leases to be longer term and for a fixed period of time as well as to have more options in the case of leaving a park. One of the major issues raised with this has been around security of tenure. So we've had questions such as should there be a minimum fixed term uh, lease agreement, say of five years. Uh, there are also issues about what happens if a park owner does sell the home. At the moment it can be sold subject to vacant possession. So should this be allowed, particularly where there are fixed term leases in place? Land prices have gone up so the villages that have been along the coast or in, in better areas, the owners decide that they can get more money by selling the land and that puts that whole village out on the street. So they say, oh, you can move these homes. It's not a 24 hour thing to move them. And um, some of the older homes don't get roadworthy certificate that they have to have to move them. Therefore, those people have to walk away and they lose their homes with no compensation. There's a lot of issues that come up, for example, in relation to fees and charges and how rent should be increased. Uh, and a lot of that comes down to what information should residents have before they take up park living so that they know fully the, the rules of a park and what they're getting into. We want our rent um, so that it doesn't go sky high because most of us uh, living in villages like this are on pension. The other thing that we are finding at the moment is that the fact that we're not allowed to sell our own homes. The um, management sell it and take their cut. Now, they're not licensed real estate people and we don't think that that's fair that we aren't allowed to sell our own homes and we would like to see that addressed. The Department of Commerce's review of the Residential Parks Act is ongoing and has recently opened for public submissions. Park residents who were dissatisfied with the Act in its first phase hope the review will bring about improvements to this popular way of life. When the Act was um, being put together before, we put in a a lot of submissions and a lot of them were just completely wiped out, you know, and we were very disappointed with the uh, original act and we're hoping that this, these days, um, we're trying to sort of talk to the politicians and get them to understand more what living in park home uh, homes are like. We encourage people to get onto our website and get a hold of a copy of the discussion paper and have a look at what we're proposing and make their say. From Kununurra to Esperance, there are a lot of people choosing this lifestyle and I'd like to think that um, they can feel secure in this sort of living and that they can be happy and not worry about the future at all. With the residential park sector growing rapidly, it seems the Department of Commerce's review has a lot of ground to cover. This has been Alicia Pereira reporting for Undercurrent. 
Well, tonight's episode finds me wandering through the beautiful and very peaceful urban orchard here in the Perth Cultural Centre. But now it's time to take a look at a little something that happened over there at the Perth Town Hall when the seniors rallied against their pension cuts. Lucy Nicholl was there. Pensioners and seniors gathered at the Fair Go for Seniors rally to see how this year's Commonwealth budget may affect them. Premier Colin Barnett announced that the Western Australian Government will not be absorbing the federal government cuts to pensioners and seniors, despite other states such as Queensland committing to do so. So Mark, tell us what the state government would like to see to do with pensioners. Uh, well, I would like to, to see the state government stand up for West Australian seniors, pensioners, self-funded retirees and take the fight up to the Commonwealth Government. I think some of the cuts that the Commonwealth Government are making are cruel and unnecessary and I think that the state, with a Premier who's the most senior in Australia, should be able to fight for our state. The concession that we're talking about, it's a Western Australian concession that will get lost, the 20 million? Uh, well, the 25 million is their, their contribution to the concession programs in Western Australia. So that's uh, rate concessions, uh, water concessions, emergency services levy, free, free transport for seniors between nine and three o'clock. So those sorts of things are the sorts of things we're talking about. I know that the people here come from a generation they are used to making sacrifices. I mean, the vast majority, I don't want to shoot people out too old, but the vast majority of you would have uh, grown up in, uh, in a wartime environment. You well, were... I was terribly interested in this because it's everything's going to affect me. The cost of medications are going up, the cost of electricity, the cost of gas. And you think, what am I going to miss out on? That's very, very hard when you're thinking of that. We're very lucky that we grow lots of fruit and veggies. So as far as that goes, you know, we're pretty, pretty lucky. But by the time you pay for everything else, there's really nothing left. I do think it is really important at this time for you all to be unified, get behind the pensioners' groups and really make your... I think we can win this. I think we can win this with your support. I'm here today to protest against the concessions for all the seniors and the pensioners. We're on very low money as it is, and if we were to lose any of our concessions, we're really going to be actually, you know, behind the eight ball. We'll probably be actually selling our cars. We won't even be able to get into transport. A lot of people will end up having depression and needing mental assistance for mental help. And I really believe that we need now to make a stand so all the pensioners should get together and senior citizens and come out, and even our children come out and support us. I'm an age pensioner. I work all my life until I got cancer. I was a single mother, made the decision for the money that I earned to pay a mortgage so that I could put a secure head over my son and myself. And I've done that, even though it's strata titled. My strata title bill keeps going up every quarter. The pension barely covers everything, but I will hang in there. Uh, the most important thing for us here, Gary, is to identify how we can help our seniors in our community. 25 million, as the Premier just pointed out, it's around about 8% of the concessions. There's 400 million in that bucket of concessions that go out to WA um, seniors and pensioners. So um, we have to look at how we can uh, at least fall back some of that money. Well, what they're doing is they're cutting $100 million out of a concession program for West Australian seniors. On top of that, they're um, changing the way the pension is uh, paid, so that'll be a redu reduction for all pensioners. Uh, they're taking away some payments for uh, healthcare card holders and uh, uh, there's a range of other changes to deeming rules and the like which are affecting uh, older West Australians. Now, the problem here is that we don't have a state government who's fighting them. You have to actually go and fight them. You can't just accept it and not do anything about it. So what we're saying to the, uh, to the state government is go and fight for Western Australia, take up the case with the Commonwealth Government. How would you fight it? What do you think is the most important thing for the Western Australian pensioners? Well, I think keeping our concessions intact is the thing the state government can influence and also try and fight to keep our health funding because $100 million a year is coming out of health funding. So going over there and pointing out to Mr Abbott that these are false savings, I think should be the West Australian government's first priority. I'm Lucy Nicholl reporting for Undercurrent. Well, recently there have been quite a lot of changes and one of those that people are not very happy about is to do with Medicare and us having to pay $7 to visit the doctor very, very soon. Well, this week we took to the streets of Perth to find out exactly what you think about that. 
The $7 Medicare co-payment for GP visits was one of the most contentious issues arising out of the recent federal budget. The government claims it will deter unnecessary GP visits, but many members of the public feel that it compromises access to health care. We hit the streets of Perth today to ask if you think Australians should pay a $7 Medicare co-payment. We already pay enough for seeing a GP, so I don't think it's fair that we do have to pay another $7. Yes, because nobody gets anything for nothing and GPs have to cover the costs of their rising costs of running their businesses. I don't think it is absolutely whatsoever, because there is people that can't actually afford their payments, but then there's some that actually is. But it's good for people that can't pay their payments, you know, they've got their benefits and all that, but people that do pay their payments, they can't afford it, but it's just not good for them in a way. You know, they, we should all have the same fair price, but we, we should all have a fair go. Enough medical fees and insurances, everything, it's just out of control. Where do we stop? $7 one week, 14 the week after. I'd be quite prepared. I think uh, at the moment my doctor bulk bills and I'm, I, I'm prepared to pay the $7. We've already paid our Medicare levy. We pay our levy in our tax and it's... It would cost more than that to administrate anyway. I'm totally against it. I think it discriminates against the low income earners and the elderly and children as well? Oh, definitely, it yes, definitely does. I think you're going to hear a lot more of it in the near future. It's, it's only the tip of the iceberg so far. People are not happy with the government system at present. And it's, going to, it's going to show. Well, it's going to affect us massive. This window, we already visited the doctor six times for, for three kids officially. Imagine seven times six is already $42 in one month. That will be massive, massive difference. Probably will, yeah. I'm, a, I'm fine. I work, so, you know, probably won't affect me that much. But I suppose in the long term, that's how they start off with $7 and then start increasing it. Absolutely. You know, every dollar counts. And food and energy and transport and communication costs are continuing to go up. I think many, many people do feel that uh, elderly people and seniors are definitely getting a rough deal, particularly with the concessions that are also uh, in line to be taken away from them. They also say that they need to recoup costs um, given the ageing population and they can save about $3.5 billion from this measure. Um, do you think that's a fair justification as well? It's kind of an argument you could, you could take that off track in terms of educating people about smoking and that kind of thing, you know, educate the youth of today not to smoke and then there may be less health issues down the line. I guess you have got to balance the books at the end of the day but can't we be a bit more creative about it? We can do all sorts of clever things but why are we still using the same tactics, the same uh, criteria to grab money you're going to end up with a big pot of money and who's to say it's going to go into those areas well they can look at allowing people to have more income so that they can have pay a certain amount of tax which would help and that way they get some back but if that's what they would be prepared to look at I don't know the views we received today were mixed and it seems the issue is more complicated than it appears this has been Alicia Pereira reporting for Undercurrent well, I'm very happy to say that this coming week is actually NAIDOC week. And there will be loads of fantastic things happening all over the place. So make sure you jump online and see what you can go and check out. Time for a quick commercial break here on Undercurrent. Well, there seems to be quite a lot of protests going on lately and a recent one in our CBD was against our Finance Minister. Kate Barnard has all the details. Outside the Avery in Perth today, as protesters are here to make themselves heard, while the Finance Minister, Matthias Corman, hosts a $250 a head luncheon for Perth's richest business people. The budget is a real offence to anyone who's got, who cares about uh, human rights, who cares about justice in, in Australia. Uh, it's a, you know, we got, we got like a situation where there's no funding whatsoever for climate change, all the climate programs are being cut back. But, uh, the, you know, the rich mining companies continue to get their subsidies, the polluting industries continue to get their subsidies. We, we've got a budget which uh, has got plenty of money to lock up refugees, but no money for Aboriginal health. So this is, a, this is a budget which is against human rights, against ordinary people. The protesters say this luncheon is just another blow to the average Australian. While the Finance Minister boasts the budget to the people who will benefit the most, Australia's richest, the rest suffer. You know, he's the Liberal Finance Minister presiding over this horrific budget. I mean, he's a right-winger who wants to grind you know, workers, students and the poor into the dust while giving handouts uh, to big business and you know, spending billions of dollars on fighter jets. And uh, you know, basically, he's also for uh, spending government money on advertising the budget, which is really not getting a lot of traction uh, in the general public, and that's why they're having these exclusive luncheons that only the rich can attend, really. 
The lunch that goes, that's going on at the moment, it's pretty standard. It's, it's nothing out of the ordinary. It's nothing that we wouldn't expect a Liberal politician to pull. It is, however, you know, when you look in the papers and hear the stories of Joe Hockey spending $50,000 to fly a gourmet chef, uh, chef all the way to America and then cuts the funding for Meals on Wheels, you know, these kind of contradictions are the things that are going to ruin this country in the long run. There will be a lot of losers in this budget, including pensioners, university students, people with a disability, the health, education and public service sectors and Indigenous programs, while the winners will be mining, infrastructure and defence. The budget's an absolute disgrace at the moment. I mean, it's attacking the middle class, it's attacking the working people of Australia. The low income earners of Australia are the ones being the hardest hit while the rich are getting off scot-free. The attacks on youth, the attacks on pensioners, the attacks on health and cuts in education are going to seriously damage this country. The organiser Alex Bainbridge has been avidly involved in the recent March in March and March Australia protests. He say today's protest is just more proof that the average Australian is against the budget and he won't stop until he and his fellow protesters are heard. Look, we're here today because um, Matthias Cormann is upstairs, you know, celebrating a $250 head uh, dinner, uh, all the cuts that he's made to ordinary people in the budget. So this is a budget that's going to have, like, terrible effects on students, on pensioners, on workers, on poor people, anyone that sees a doctor. There's a whole lot, just about every sector of the population is affected by this budget, and these people upstairs are drinking up and, like, toasting our misery. So we're here to say we're not going to accept it. We're going to keep on coming back again and again. We're going to fight this budget all the way. Cuts to health and education, changes to the pension to make it harder to claim aged and disability payments, the US-style privatisation of university fees, funding withdrawal for Indigenous health and foreign aid, and the raised retirement age to 70 are just some of the programs set to be hit by the budget, while defence is boosted and corporate tax is reduced by 1.5%. Most students are, are worried about what's happening, like my hex debt's going to um, uh, be charged the interest rate, extra interest rate, uh, so it'll take me a lot longer to pay off my hex debt. Um, you know, I have a sibling who I want to go to university and uh, it's obviously going to price out a whole series of um, young people who are graduating high school. I'm undergoing uh, medical treatment for heart, cancers and I have to park my car at the station every day to go for treatment. It's costing me, or it will be from the second. If you look at the pensioners, how many people support uh, voluntary organisations? I personally can put anywhere from 20 to 30 hours a week voluntary work. If a government, federal and state and local governments had to pay for it, it would cost them billions. They ought to look at the true cost of a pensioner. While the protesters were out here, it is heard that Matthias Cormann has cancelled his luncheon. I think it's great. It's a total victory. Um, this keeps happening over and over again. I, uh, I mentioned before that um, Julie Bishop cancelled a speaking engagement at UWA because she heard the protesters were going to be there. So obviously we've got them on the run a bit. Um, they aren't really confident to even try and sell their uh, budget in public um, or you know have a little bit of opposition outside. Uh, it's pretty pathetic and I think it shows that you know we're on the right side and that um, we have support from um, you know when most people are against the budgets. While the luncheon cancellation has been seen as a success by the protesters, they are still going to march in July. Kate Barnard reporting for Undercurrent. Well, a little while ago on Undercurrent, we showed you a story where a WA farmer was having a legal battle to do with genetically modified crops. Well, Lucy Nicholl recently found out, unfortunately, he lost that battle. Supreme Court Justice Kenneth Martin recently dismissed organic farmer Steve Marsh's claim against his neighbour Michael Baxter, who was growing genetically modified canola in Western Australia. The contamination incident happened in 2010, which was the first year of commercial release of the GM canola here in WA. And yes, we, um, you know, we told the minister that GM con contamination would happen and indeed it happened in that first year. Minister Redmond or ex-Minister Redmond, he made the decision to ignore liability and, and um, made a statement in Parliament saying we can bring it, bring it in and, and let the courts decide. So this is what it's about. It's, a, it's disgusting that it had to get to a farmer versus farmer. It's tearing the farming community apart. So it should never have been left up to the farmers to have to sort it out uh, over the the back fence as, as the Minister um, put it at the time and continues to put it. Um, I mean like any uh, 
relationship is, you know, like once it breaks down, well, what, what do you do then? And to have to resort to, like, the Supreme Court, the top court in Western Australia, to try and resolve what the government should have, so, have, should have sorted out long before. Um, you know, long we had a moratorium in place for, you know, good reason. It was going to happen. You're going to have economic loss. You're going to have, from the contamination, and who's liable? So is, is the responsibility for the GM farmer to can keep their product contained or is it the responsibility for the non-GM farmer to try and keep it out? Organic farmer Steve Marsh has since lodged an appeal which will be heard by three judges in the next six to 12 months. There needs to be some sort of an insurance um, to, to cover losses. There's $70 a tonne difference. Uh, between a non-GM um, canola and GM. So if you get contamination, who should be paying that? Why should the non-GM farmer pay that loss? So it's all about accountability. Who's responsible? There will be no winners here. This is a farmer versus farmer. Who's really um, behind, who's, who's the one at fault is the government. Monsanto's writing the rule book here and it is at their whim and their call um, as to what they do. Ideally, it should be Monsanto on the stand here and it should be a class action, uh, but the way the contracts have gone, it ends up being uh, the non-GM farmer suing the GM farmer, which is totally wrong. The government ignored their legislative responsibility and just let this happen. The Western Australian Department of Agriculture and Food has recently requested that the organic standard be lifted from zero tolerance to a tolerance level of 0.9%. The Organic Industry Standards and Certification Council could make a decision on this request as soon as August. I'm Lucy Nicholl, reporting for Undercurrent. Ooh, isn't our city an exciting place these days? We'll tell you more about that very soon. But next up on Undercurrent, Tibor Mazaros has a chat with finance author Peter Strom. My guest is Peter Stucken, who is the Sustainable Population Party Rep in WA. Peter, tell us something about the Sustainable Population Party. So it was created in Sydney by our founder, uh, William Burke, and he and I had both been members of the Sustainable Population Australia uh, NGO, which has a long history, about 25 years, w bringing up issues yes. concerning with population. But in 2009, uh, Kevin Rudd, who was then Prime Minister, got on the 7.30 report and famously declared that he was for big Australia. I'm not ashamed to admit I'm for big Australia. And the... the, the, uh, the uh, polling and the, the back room chat in the Labor Party went ballistic and everyone was going like, you're crazy. Because when you ask people in the street, there'd been a number of surveys done, news poll, all sorts of polls, yes. uh, party polls, showing that 70% of people don't want the big Australia and 30% of people either don't know or they're, they're supporting it for one reason or another. Yes. When the party was first formed, it was the Stable Population Party. Because yes. we thought sustainable is a greenwashed word. They talk about sustainable development, sustainable yes. growth, sustainable mining. That's the so only word said, they're using these days. Well, that's why we didn't use it initially. We said stable. We want stable. But people don't understand stable. You know, despite the fact that, as you say, and I agree, sustainable is an overused word. It's lost its meaning. Uh, people do sort of understand that sustainable. I mean, sustainable mining means that you can continue to mine until you get caught, you know? Continue <laughs> to mine until you run out, you know? It's not sustainable. Not at all. No, but people don't understand stable. So at, before the last election, we changed our name to sustainable population. Hash sustainable population. So I think people sort of get the fact that we're actually an environmental party and we view that the environmental destruction which is happening because... 7.4, 7.2 billion of us are swarming over this planet and taking up 40% of the land mass for our own personal use and food and fibre and accommodation. So yep. we are not an ageing nation because we now the average There's age. More, more What's the average age of Australia? Do you know 37. that? 37. 37. And it's gone up from 30 over the last 50 years. With this ageing population, we should be... Why, are people, why have we got an ageing population? Well, people are living longer, healthier, happier lives. People are working into their 70s and 80s. I mean, what you need to look at is the number of working people in the community versus the number of people who are not working. And what the politicians are looking at is the number of people in the working age, between the age of 15 and 65, 
So who's working at 16 these days? I mean, this is an old categorisation which goes back 50 years and it's got nothing to do with... The, with reality. With or reality. No. And 50 years ago, when Australia's fertility rate was like three and a half, there were many more younger people who were also burdens on the community for their schooling, for their health, you know, all of that. So now we've got smaller families. Sure, there's more people in the older age group. I don't think it's an issue. And in, in any case, what's the solution? You can't breed your way to having a younger population. It's Can complete you? It's insanity. It's a Ponzi scheme, isn't it, really? <laughs> You're trying to, like, if you bring people into Australia or have all the children... It's a pleasure scheme because everyone has to make kids. Well, that's... That, you can practice all you like, Tibor, but you don't necessarily have to have... You know, there's, there's technology available, let me tell you. <laughs> bring you into the real world. <laughs> and just before we go, Perth now has something rather European, I have to say. We have our very own ice skating rink right here at the Perth Cultural Centre and to the side over here plenty of comfy bean bags so you can sit back and watch people learning to skate right here in our very own city. Well that's all from me this week don't forget to join us again next week for more Undercurrent.